using uh, some of the tools that are built from the GeoLocate project within a, a fishnet georeferencing project. So just to you know, cover the basics, what is georeferencing? The whole goal is to take locality data, strings of text, and convert them into latitudes and longitudes and then have some kind of associated uncertainties with, with those uh, points. Um, the problem is, if, you know, for, if you look at all the collections globally, there's estimates of over 3 billion specimens, and it could be anywhere from a half billion collecting events that need to be georeferenced. So if we do that using traditional techniques of using, you know, paper maps or even using GIS systems, you know, we have a task that's not something we can do within, you know, within a reasonable scale. So we need to find alternative approaches to, to georeferencing and make life a lot easier and, and more streamlined. So that's what led to the creation of the GeoLocate project, going back to probably around 2003 or late 2002. Um, most of the, just to give you a little bit about the background and history, the Tulane Fish Collection was all georeferenced by hand um, back in the late 90s. So when I started working at Tulane, one of the things we wanted to do was to see if we could leverage some of that uh, hand georeference data and use that as a test case for building automated tools for georeferencing. Project, the geolocate project. And so a typical workflow using geolocate first starts off with the data entry phase. And you know that could be as simple as uploading data to uh, you know packing data in, but usually that's where you're doing a lot of cleanup, making sure your, your county names are all standardized, your state, your country, and all of that that meets the requirements so that you'll get the best results out of georeferencing and minimizing the amount of work you have to do. So that might be something where you can use Google or Find or something like that for processing. Uh, preparing your data. Then you load it in geolocate, and that's where the automated phase goes, where geolocate goes through your data, parses it, does all kinds of calculations, and tries to figure things out, and it creates a bunch of results for that locality, trying to figure out where that locality could be. And then there's the phase, it's the manual phase, you know, so the, the initial outputs of geolocate are just guesses from a computer program. So now it's up to an end user to look at those results and say, yes, this is correct, or no, this isn't correct, and make any kind of adjustments as necessary. So if we go back to the history of geolocate, like I said, it dates back to around 2002, 2003. Back then, even though the web was, you know, was developing, was highly developed at that time. Um, Web-based technologies for doing mapping and stuff were not as mature as there are, they are now. Google Maps did not exist, or at least not the state it exists now, and using some of these systems was very difficult. So the original version of GeoLocate is this desktop application. It's still available on our website. You can download it, install it, and run GeoLocate within, a, you know, within your local desktop without having any internet connectivity. But within the past five, six years, we've moved the application to the web, and that's actually what I recommend everyone use, because that's what accesses our latest and greatest versions of our algorithms. It's had the most development behind it. It uses gazetteers that aren't available within the desktop application. So that's largely what I'm recommending. And also, the web-based application has access to all web-based, the major web-based mapping um, features like Google Maps or Bing or some entry services and, and others that I'll talk about later. So here's just an example of how the desktop application works. Just to give you an idea of the workflow, if you were to take some locality data in this particular example, it's the Palapusa River, five miles north of Buchanan at Highway 27. You type all that into the program, you get georeference, and in this particular example, it's able to actually put a point at that bridge crossing where the Palapusa River meets. Highway 27, and it's able to do that because we've done a lot of pre-processing of data on the server, um, you know, on, on, within the geolocate program beforehand. So if we have a, we've pre-computed every bridge crossing in the United States beforehand. So if we can find that data within your, your locality stream, we go through and we can snap the point to that bridge crossing. And so here's an example of what the current version of the web-based application looks like. The idea was to try to keep some kind of similarity between what desktop application and what the web-based applications look like. So you, see, you know, still have the map pane up at the top, you can type your data in, and then click a georeference button and then go through the process of georeferencing it. So like I said, we have all this data in the Tulane Fish Collection that was georeferenced by hand, so we can use that for measuring the performance of the algorithms and seeing how good they're doing compared to some of this hand georeference data. So if we look at um, Georeference data for all U.S. localities within the Tulane Fish Collection. Geolocate was able to put 
points on about 95% of those records. In some cases, it didn't do a very good job. In other cases, it ran out of money. But on average, for a U.S. location, it was about 6.1 kilometers off with about two kilometers of standard error. So what that's telling me, the reason that's important is if I look at a map and I'm looking at a six kilometer radius, that's not an entirely, that's not a huge area that I have to scan with my eyes to try to find out where this point needs to be. So within the U.S. it actually works pretty well and the job of verifying localities is not as difficult as it, as it is in other places. Now if you look at the algorithm performance for outside the U.S., it's not as nice a picture. So if you look at some Australian data, well, we also took some data that was hand geo-referenced and we made some comparisons. And before we had upgraded some of the data that GeoLocate is using, we were able to um, geo-reference the data and get about 86% of the, the data geo-referenced with about almost 800 kilometers off. And as you can see in the first map on, on the on your left, the, um, that's a huge area for you to scan and try to find where the correct place is. Or on the one on the right, it, it's only 218 kilometers off. And the reason you're seeing that difference is that's after we have upgraded some of the core gazetteers that GeoLocate is using. And so anytime people are using GeoLocate and they find it's not working well for a particular area of the world they're in, but they're always going to some other kind of resource to, to find results, if they let us know about that, that information, we can sometimes go out and see if we can incorporate that data into GeoLocate to make it more, more accurate for those areas. And so, like I said, one aspect of GeoLocate is that the, the idea of producing coordinates, but then the other aspect is this, this um, user and environment where you take a point and you just drag it on the map and create some kind of uncertainty around it. So it lets you look at the, the results and make adjustments as necessary. So one of the problems with georeferencing from an automated perspective is that oftentimes you'll get a lot of results due to ambiguous names or multiple displacements within a locality. You know, maybe not having a county, just not having a county associated with your locality description increases your search area by such a large amount that you end up finding a lot of duplicate places. So we have to have some kind of way of identifying which records to, to work with. So what GeoLocate does is it will create one, it'll, it'll select one of the records as being the most accurate record, and it has a built-in scoring algorithm where it will score each and every result and then rank them, and then it'll give the one with the highest score um, a active marker that you can then take and drag around and, and, and work with that one. And then you could evaluate all the other results as needed. So for measuring uncertainty, GeoLocate offers a number of different options. One is you could just ignore uncertainty and just record a point. Um, some collections do do that, and you know historically that is what has been done. The most common method used today is probably representing your uncertainty as a point radius, where you have a point, and then from that central point you measure out some distance and you record that radius in, in, in meters. And then a third alternative would be to store a point, potentially a radius as well, and a polygon. And what the polygon does is it allows you to have a much more accurate representation of your, your locality description. And what's really nice about the polygon, as opposed to the point radius, is the point radius always references your locality as being that central point with which a radius expands out from. And because of that, your locality is always centered to that, to that uncertainty. Well, within a polygon, your, your most likely point would be anywhere within that polygon, which gives you a higher degree of flexibility in describing those localities without increasing your uncertainty to a higher, higher degree than it really needs to be. So there are a number of different options available in some of the georeferencing, and some of these you might want to turn off if you know you have a lot of terrestrial localities that may not be located anywhere near water bodies, so you might turn that feature off altogether. So one example, one feature is the match water body feature, where we have linear networks for all the water bodies in the United States and for some selected countries. So if my location references a particular river or stream within the locality description, we're able to, after the georeferencing process, we can then identify where that stream is and then snap the point to the nearest point on that stream. So if I'm seven miles north of some place, I can then find the closest point on that stream to that seven miles north of the location and snap it to the stream. And then as I was talking over earlier, the ability to identify uh, bridge crossings as well. So for polygons, GeoLocate also offers a number of different options. One is you can use the first option would be to just generate polygons. So if I type in Lawrence, Kansas, I get a point for Lawrence, Kansas, and then it gives me a, a polygon that represents the outline for Lawrence, Kansas. 
Kansas. And so I might want to use that as the uncertainty if I want to know where Lawrence can what the uh, outline of Lawrence, Kansas is. The other option is I could not displace the polygon, which means I could leave the polygon sitting at Lawrence, Kansas, assuming my location has a displacement involved. So in the second example, if it says 15 miles north of Lawrence, Kansas, without and I turn the displacement feature off, it will still generate a polygon, but it's going to leave that polygon over Lawrence, Kansas, and, and just displace my point. And what that does is actually gives you a good visual cue of where, uh, of the bounds of the area that it found within the locality description. And then the other option would be to actually take the polygon for Lawrence, Kansas, and displace it 15 miles north. And what that allows you to do is, you know, in the uh, in the pane to the, to the right there, you can see that anywhere, you can see the outline of where Lawrence, Kansas would be if I moved it 15 miles north, and that's potentially anywhere where the collector could have been where he was um, making the collection. And so as I was talking about different visualization layers within the web-based application, so right now, as a um, today, we currently support all the different Google layers, the layers from Microsoft, a number of topo maps from Esri, a world topo layer, as well as the uh, uh, US topo layer, and then another layer called MapNIC, which what that is, or it's, it's data coming from the OpenStreetMaps project, which is a community source uh, mapping project where, where just, you know, anyone can contribute to the quality of the data and add, you know, so if you're you know, if you're looking at a map and you see that there's no stream shown there, you could actually go and contribute the data to that, that project so that stream would show up and when they incorporate it into their data set, it then gets incorporated into our system as well. So to talk a little bit about some of the core features of the web application. So I have just a couple of red arrows pointing to some of the, the things I'd like to just point out. You know, so up, So up here, where the top red arrow is, it's pointing to this little icon up there. What that does, it actually lets you take off. A lot of times it'll be georeferencing, and you're on our website, it's just this tiny little window, and you can't see, see everything you need to see, and you'll be able to see a lot more new accurate georeferencing. You click that, and it'll actually expand the map window to fill your entire browser window. So if you're working on a big monitor, you actually see a lot more data at one time, so that becomes very useful. Um, the next red arrow is a little plus sign that expands all the different data layers that you can use for georeferencing. Um, down here at the bottom, there's this workbench pane, so this is where you type in all your data and work with your data. There is another little pane that you can click on, and it shows all the results that geolocate would return back. In this particular example, it says Hayes Creek, three miles north of Franklin, and on Highway 25. And it says it only found one possible location, and I could end up going, if there were more locations, I could go to that tab and navigate through the results and go through them one at a time and see which is the most accurate one. Um, there are a number of different options for drawing polygons. If my results are way off the screen and I see it anywhere <coughs> on my map that I want to put my marker on, I can just hit the place marker and then click anywhere on the screen and just add my active marker on the screen, as well as I can measure across the map using a little measuring tool. Um, every, uh, another thing is that I can, if I click on any point, I can see the results that came back to the point. So in this one, I can see it found Hayes Creek at Highway 25, and it comes back with an uncertainty radius. And then if I came through and I drew a polygon around, let's say, a section of Hayes Creek that I thought was my uncertainty, and what I wanted to do was automatically size my uncertainty radius to best fit this polygon, and then click this little expand uncertainty the polygon, and my uncertainty radius would now automatically expand to whatever polygon I'm using so that my polygon and uncertainty radius are in sync. And then this little box down here is just a tab delimited box of your results so that if you wanted to cut and paste it say into Excel, it should in most cases allow you to just to, you know triple click on that box to select all the data within that box and then cut and paste it into Excel. And then these little check boxes up here indicate what I want displayed within my cut and paste box. So if I'm not interested in copying the uncertainty over or the error polygon, I can just uncheck those and only my latitude and longitude will be shown in that box. So I'm able to decide what it is I want to copy and paste. 